She tells you that she's very similar to herself in the sense that she can talk, speak at great length. The difference is Inaharis tends to not speak on topics of interest, by which she means the <laughs> arcane sciences. Huh. She's a Maybe fearful. We'll get she talks about... Everything's of interest to someone. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yes, she's very opposed to people kind of cheating at magic by making deals with devils and such like. So if it's true that Drew Dalf was doing this, do you mention to her what's become of him at all? No. Okay. She asks if she should do anything in particular if he does come around again. Um, I mean, you I know what? Know. Send us a message. Yeah, you could. You should probably send us a message. I don't know that he's actually going to be dangerous, though. He did assault someone on in the uh, restaurant on the other side of town. That sounds dangerous to me. Yeah. Yeah. If he comes around was... again, send us a message very quickly. She nods. She says that she'll also pass along the word to her evening acolyte. Thank you. After they leave the door, I'm just like, you know what? Actually, I hadn't been considering, but maybe we should have been worrying about that from the start. Yeah. And Lucius, this afternoon you were going to set up this... set up. Continue setting up this meeting? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to go back to... Uh, I was going to go back to Elman and... Uh, and let him know that uh, that I've set up a meet for this evening. Okay. And he hasn't done the thing you asked yet, but he's totally going to get around to it. I'm sure he is. <laughs> Just as soon as... I he mean, if you, need, if you need assistance, I'd be more than willing to help you in that regard. <laughs> no, he just needs to talk to his father. Probably okay. this evening. Alright. Gustavus, take the benefits of short rests. Are you doing anything this afternoon? Yes, I'm going to... I guess I just wander around the house for a bit, see my note, and be like, oh, drunk Gus comes through again, and then go <laughs> investigate. Uh, I'm going to go speak to the the heraldry lady. I'm going to leave a note telling everybody where I went. The heraldry lady? The, the old witch mm -hmm. woman? Yeah. And what are Alex and Seeker doing in the afternoon? I'm pretty sure we're both going to go talk to that furblog priest. Yeah, let's go talk to this Warlock's main person. That sounds like someone I should have met a couple days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so you can see Broken Wall along the western side of the village here. The manor that they send you to is in West Harbor, right up against the wall. So just on the opposite side of Broken Wall, probably along this stretch here. Gustavus. Let me bring up my Wharf Town map here. It'll be nice once I have a full collection of these, I think. <laughs> First of all, is this woman known to you? Have you had a reason to pay a visit to Petunia Greycolor at all in the past? I think Gus would be pretty familiar with Wharf, Wharf Town all over because, like, this is probably where he would have been based out of before he, like, when he first got to town. Okay. She is a, uh, she was badly scarred with a childhood illness, uh, that left her very pale and hairless on one side of her head. So she very much looks the part of an old witch woman. It does occur to you that you don't actually know how old she is though. Yeah. She's something of a neighborhood healer and trinket seller. But she is known throughout Dunfoss for her fervent belief in the power of symbols and iconography. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, does she like you? I mean, I don't, I can't think of any reason why she would dislike us. Have you used her services before in the past? Probably would have, you know, bought... Like, you said she's, like, a medicine woman. Probably would have... A little bit of everything. Palm reading. She's got poultices. Probably can... would have, like, purchased, like, basic medical supplies and stuff from treat, her. Treat the boils yeah. on your feet kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. But, like, not any of her, uh, like, palm reading type services. 
she inquires about your friends and co-workers when you come around. And she does this each time you come around. And she mentions them by name. She seems to know of Flump Incorporated. So I guess that would be a good time. Do any of the rest of you make use of Petunia Grace Colors services at any point? Uh, Seekers asked her questions sometimes just to kind of as a talking shop sort of thing because he is also very interested in what images say about people. About so, Alex. like, he'll go to her to be like, hey, what would make this person believe that I was this? I mean, Alex has a, at least in for, at least a minor knowledge and professional working relationship with literally everyone in the city who can provide various alchemical components. What about Florian? I rolled a die, and the die said yes. <laughs> Fair enough. Where'd you find that die? What's that? Where'd you find Lucius? the yes die? It's on the <laughs> table. <laughs> Lucius. Lucius would have gone to her for esoteric magical components, read stuff that warlocks use. Does Yudok, does the Yudok family have a house coat of arms? <clears throat> to be clear, they wouldn't have in the previous campaign, because Kiska didn't have a tradition of heraldry, but Dunfoss does. So it's possible that the Yudoks might have adopted heraldry when yeah, they... Yeah, I would say... I would say yes. Which is what? Um. Uh, this might also be a good back. question for Alex too, since he's also flint gray field with a crack across it in the middle. With a crack you across come back it. Come to me on that. Yep. Okay, so Alex and Lucius. This woman is known to, uh, in the past. She has been known to refuse custom to noble houses if she doesn't like their symbols. This has not been your experience with her. And every time any of you visit her, she does ask about your other companions. And she always asks by name, like an old grandmother would. And today, Gustavus is visiting her. And she makes the same inquiries. What does Gustavus say in response to news from your well, companions? <clears throat> Everybody's fine, except uh, Seeker kind of died, but then we got him better. Uh, Florian's still weird. Nope, nope, no. Stop. She very slowly <laughs> puts a kettle on. She draws all the windows closed in her house. She very slowly pours each of you a cup of boiling water. And steeps a tea ball in each one. As she does this, she retrieves an old deck of cards from a worn leather case. And she holds them in a stack in front of her. And she says, she bids you drink deeply of the tea. And then, in great detail, speak the first words that come to mind when you witnessed your friend Seeker's death. Uh, well, first of all, Gus will just... No, not me. first of all. Just drink deeply of the tea. She's okay. demanding you do this. Okay, I'll drink the tea. <laughs> yes. And then, um, the first, like, she wants two words? Speak the first words that come to you about your friend, when you witnessed your friend Seeker's death. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. That was two words, but it was like the same two words... And she also drinks deeply, and she begins... I mean, you've seen tarot card readings before. Oh, I guess, Seeker, did you take the tool proficiency, or did you take deception? I already had deception. Okay. Do you know what your diviner's tools actually are? I'm going to say that the Seekers will just be, like, a set of astrological charts. Okay. He knows how the rest work, he just doesn't use them regularly. Well, the way they work is you just do whatever and then lie about it. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. He could give a convincing like speech on what the yeah. tower means. Nice. But it's not his day to day. How much does Gus, like how much stop, stock does Gustavus put in these kinds of readings? He will be very polite and he will let her finish. She's... And he will look interested. But he works with Seeker. 
Okay. So she flips not very much. a bunch of cards and she says some words in a language that you don't understand. And she drinks deeply of her own tea. And she sits very quietly, monitoring her own breathing for a moment. And then her eyes snap open as she regards the cards on the table. And she slaps her hands down on them and begins mixing them up very chaotically. And she sweeps her hands across the table and the cards go flying. And her cup of tea splatters against the wall. And she's breathing very raggedly. Her head snaps up at you and she says, The thing that came back was not your friend Seeker. Seeker is still dead. I have seen it. Oh, okay. Gus will put his tea down. And... I will take care of that. Uh, you must tread carefully. It may even think that it is Seeker. But its true nature will reveal itself. 50 sessions in. Nodal's like, ah, ah, I was a demon all of uh, <laughs> No, uh, and it's just like, okay, I, mean, I, will keep a, a, I will keep an eye on Seeker, on his animated corpse, as you say. But the reason I came... She reaches out and, and grabs your hand and pulls it forward across the table and turns it palms up. She says, did you bring silver? Did you bring coin? Uh, I will... Give her a silver piece. She takes the silver piece. And it disappears into the folds of her robes. And she shuffles over to a little table in the side of the room. And she worries in a drawer. Pulls out little knickknacks here and there. And what emerges is she pulls out a silver needle. Like a sewing needle. Mm -hmm. and she holds it up to the candle burning in the room. And the light glints off of it. And she places it in the palm of your hand very gingerly. She says, you must boil this needle in fresh water each day at dawn. And when the thing that is not Seeker reveals itself, you will know what to do with it. Gus says, gra very gravely looks at her and says, thank you very much, ma'am. And he pockets it in his uh, front pocket. And he says, while I have your attention, though, can you tell me anything about a uh, some heraldry? Like, have you seen... And I'll describe the flying pig. How, like, there's some bad juju surrounding it, and we, you, your name immediately came to mind. When... Are, you, are you accusing her of bad juju? No. No, no, no. Of knowing of bad juju. Like, being able to recognize it. She does another reading. Similar to the first. She gathers up all the cards, stacks them up neatly. Consults the cards and speaks in her unknowable language. She tells you that the pig is seen as a filthy and wretched creature. But in truth, pigs are quite clever and intelligent. The nature of a pig is to be a clever creature that is underestimated because of its state of being. And she tells you that every pig has a strain of violence in them that harkens back to their boar ancestors. That pigs are dangerous both because of their strength and their cleverness, but also because of this layer of deception. The wings to her suggest a breaking of limits. She thinks that your flying pig is a fiendish presence that most civilized folk will overlook until it's too late and who is gaining power quickly. And when she says that, she makes motions with her hands like the flapping of wings. Gus is like, he's like stroking like his chin and he's thinking because like, you know, she kind of, you know, nascent warlock. Is there, uh, have you, and I'll ask her, have you seen, has anybody come around Wharftown that you're aware of that has been flying this banner? She has never seen this iconography on a banner before, no. And she okay. doesn't know of any Dunfossen house that uses it. But just ba oh. she's just going basic on your description of the flying pig that you've seen in the wax. Okay. 
So she is unaware of anybody like using this coat of arms in Wharftown. She has, I mean, people of Wharftown don't fly a lot of banners at the best of times. But no, it's not one that she's familiar with as being associated with the Dunfossen family. I'll describe the servant to her. Have you seen this man wandering around Wharftown? You mean Thettle? Yes. She says that halflings are small and easy to escape her notice. She stops for a moment. Then she looks at you very focused. She says, when one thinks of it, a halfling is very much like a pig. They're both round and soft and easy to overlook. You should beware a winged halfling, my friend. Okay. <laughs> this is about how meetings with Petunia Grey Color go. Like, Gus is, like, making his farewells. He finishes his tea, mm -hmm. and, he's, and he, he bows to her and makes his farewell. And as he's walking out, he's like, stupid drunk Gus. <laughs> <laughs> and as you're leaving the door, she calls after you. Remember, every morning at dawn, fresh water. Okay. And he, like, gives her a thumbs up, and he just kind of walks out. Should we take a pull to see how many days you, you until you forget to do this? Or do you plan I mean, to forget immediately? Maybe. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how I feel about it. Alex and Seeker paying a call mm -hmm. on Inaharis Warlock's Bane. Uh, this woman, she lives in what was once a manor house in Dunfoss. Some old family that had to liquidate their funds or whatever. She herself is not a noble. She just lives in a big house. She is, however, very wealthy because she's a professional demon hunter and has had a lifetime of adventure. And adventurers make a stupid amount of money. Like, if any of you guys had any intelligence, you would become adventurers rather than detectives. Like Why do you think I got an archaeology degree? It just hasn't worked out. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, adventurers, they like they go, they go kill like six orcs and they walk home with 700 gold. Like, just in gems and coin. It's ridiculous. They get to roll on magic item tables and... That sounds terrible. Adventuring groups get so much cool magic shit that they get some magic shit that they're like, eh, whatever. That's not even interesting anymore. That doesn't sound like fun at all. That sounds like that sounds like we're constantly worried about like our health and well being and constantly on edge and paranoid, searching for traps and stuff. Like no, no way. Didn't your Not coworker way. just get killed in the tur in I the line of no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no, <that laughs> is... You really trust a magical item you haven't built yourself. Exactly. <laughs> it's a banana. You don't know where that Michael. magic item's been. <laughs> Ina Harris lives alone she doesn't even have any servants uh, and when you come to call she is actually out working her garden and her garden is nice and well kept but also very questionable in terms of like the plants that she chooses she's obviously not choosing them for aesthetics because they look a lot like weeds and as you step in through the open gate, she calls out to you and cautions not to brush up against that purple one because it's dreadfully poisonous. Alex is going to give it a wide berth. Okay. Uh-huh. And I mean, she's dirty, head to toe. She looks every bit like a fearbolg who has been in the wilderness for weeks. She puts her trowel and bucket aside and steps up and greets you good morning or right, good, good afternoon morning. I suppose. Uh, my name is alexander this is my compatriot the seeker in the darkness we're from flumfink and we're trying to investigate a uh hedge wizard named drudolf the cosmic she says that she's seen his tricks she's not impressed what have you seen in the darkness oh seeker Ah, uh, well, there was a hand coming out of it that killed me instantly. No, save. <laughs> hey, that hand was glowing. That whole room was glowing. It wasn't that dark. It was pretty dark for me. She asks where the hand touched you. 
<laughs> show us on the doll. Show us on the doll. God damn it. Yeah, this sneaker will show her. She might know some. She might get something off of it. Seeing the wound, you see recognition flash in her eyes immediately. She says, "Quickly, you must come with me." All right, let's let's do it. She takes you into her manor, and this is very clearly a house built for a large family and all of their servants, and only one woman lives here. This is a drafty, dusty, and mostly empty manor. Peering into most of the rooms, you're just looking at furniture covered with dust-caked sheets. Uh, she takes you down a long hallway to a few of the rooms that she does use towards the back. She bids you sit down while she takes her a, uh, a looking glass and sits down and examines the wound closely. And she identifies the spell that did this to you. She describes the incantation that Drew Delph used and she describes what you saw and what you must have felt. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's actually why we came to talk to you. She says there's little that she can offer in the way of healing, although if you're feeling any residual pain, she might be able to alleviate it some somewhat. Uh, I'm mostly fine, just a little weak at the moment. <laughs> um, actually, the, the interesting part was in his room, we found this. It was a sigil or something, right? The warlock symbol? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've got a class feature called... Let's see Another it. page... Of course, everything takes forever. Magical tinkering that allows me to imbue in a tiny object with a bunch of different effects, but one of them is a picture. Mm -hmm. And I will pull out one of the stone coins, infuse it with a little bit of magic, and cause a image of that symbol to appear on it. Okay. She looks the symbol over for a moment. She says it's ridiculous uh, that pigs don't fly. There was some cursory research that pointed to that it was something of a beginning of a warlocked pact, but from a creature that probably couldn't grant that sort of power? Was what our initial research came to. As she sits back in her chair and grabs a large smelly pipe from a nearby table and takes several large drags off of it. She tells you that there is no greater fool in this world than one who would make a pact with a fell being. Oh, and I'll also explain the list of things we found in that note. Like, it was a list of things to be performed to get this pact to be sealed, right? Uh, yeah. One of which was to assassinate Percival Penniless. Yep. She asks what became of this man. Where is he now? Uh, I think the authorities got him. We apprehended him, and we're not sure what happened to him after he got handed over. And she tells you if she were able to interrogate the man, she might be able to find out more about the creature he's had dealings with. But just this symbol of a flying pig doesn't mean anything to her. She has not seen it before. She thinks the very concept of a flying pig is ridiculous. If you want to see a fiendish pig... <laughs> Are you going to finish that sentence? I'm curious. Oh, yeah. She has <laughs> books and drawings. <clears throat> Which one looks most like a pig? There is one. I'm forgetting what it's called at the moment. You guys have fought them before. Uh, not a, not a Nupperibo. A Nalfeshni. Uh... Yeah, like no, a sure, giant yep. bear slash boar with black feathered wings and enormous tusks. She shows you pictures of this creature and tells you some of the methods by which you might combat them or by which you might bind them if they are summoned. So if you see a symbol like that, that's when you know when to be frightened. Huh. So, do you know any fiends who might... Because clearly something gave him this power. Who might use a symbol like this as a joke? She agrees. If you're talking about the same Drudalf that she knows, that he doesn't command this power of his own accord. 
Any fiends given to pranks? She says that when fiends play pranks, men lose their souls. If I, and I'm not, this is hypothetical to try and, you know, track through this guy's thought process. Mm -hmm. If I were interested in forming a warlock pact with something like this, what would my first steps be? How can we go and find what he would have been doing? She asks you what's the worst thing you've ever done to another person. And I mean, be absolutely honest. I don't mean you shortchanged someone or you accidentally tripped someone in the street. I mean, what is the most heinous, most awful thing that you've done to another person in your life? I mean, well... Okay, I guess I did kind of let slip a big secret about my father that got him effectively exiled here. <laughs> she says you're going to have to do way worse than that if you're going to attract the notice of, of the Hells. How did... Why would they go after Troutoof? He he was the, he was a goddamn prestigious chasing street wizard. Well, What's the worst thing he would have done until this? Maybe but sure, the assassination was a problem, but if it needs to be that bad, maybe that's what we should be looking for. Like whatever like it unsolved was, unsolved crimes, like yeah, like murder of children. Or am I on? Is that in the right path? She says you're definitely in the right ballpark, but it would have to be something malicious and premeditated, absolutely malevolent. A senseless act of crime or bloodshed from which there is no material gain. For example, if you were to kill a man so you can take his bag of gold, that's perfectly understandable. If you were to kill a man just to watch him slowly bleed and die, a devil somewhere might raise an eyebrow. In order for him to gain these powers, is it your belief that that must have happened? She absolutely believes this. Okay. So, the question yeah. I have for you is, you guys work with a warlock, <laughs> who is, you know, has a pact with some fiend somewhere. So do you want Seeker's actual opinion? I'm asking he what... That, he... Yeah, he I'm got asking... in on nepotism. On nepotism. <laughs> Like, he just comes from a long line of warlocks. Like, it's just bureaucracy. Yeah, I mean, Alexander's got the same opinion. It's just, he knows enough about history to know that there used to be slavery in that part of the world. So he figures it's just, like, it's not just nepotism, it's, like, credit. Like, they have, like, some amount of debt owed to that family because they of got, all the evil they did in the past. They have warlock reparations? Yep. Alright, I think we're done here. <laughs> we can all go home. <laughs> that was... Yeah, okay. But you don't tell her about Lucius or any of your... No. No, because I don't find it to be relevant. Because, okay. like, this person didn't get it from family. He got it, like, suddenly. Okay. Hey, this is this is also a really stupid question. What were the other things he was supposed to do on that list? I don't recall. <laughs> okay. Not important. The okay, important thing was okay, that good. Lucius got warlock right okay i wasn't like i was like trying to figure out like should we go find someone else trying to do those things or she asks if you can give her a little time she can do a little digging on her end find out uh if maybe there's something that happened in the city that's escaped her notice i mean you have to forgive her it's a big city and she's actually retired from this line of work but you do see an exhilaration kind of coming to life in her oh any sort of help would be excellent should we send a should we send a runner for you at some point she shakes her head no and she bids you to stand and leads you into a a room off of the solar where you're currently sitting and there's not a door to this room she reaches up and takes a book on a shelf next to a cold hearth and moves it out and the shelf opens up revealing a secret passage behind into a stone windowless room. Seeker claps his hands together excitedly. <laughs> He's like, oh, I get to seek in some darkness now. And she takes you into what I would simply describe as a Belmont trophy room. Oh, from the <laughs> show? I mean... 
you see all kinds of implements for hunting and slaying monsters. Every myth or legend you've ever read about a monster being slayed in a particular way, she's got in this room. She has all different kinds of weapons made out of all kinds of crazy materials. Things that would never be practical in actual day-to-day -day use. She's got colored vials of liquid lined up and organized by the hundreds on the wall. She is has... that a is that an adamantine holy water sprinkler? <laughs> she takes one of these small vials, and inside is a very viscous, orangey kind of tinged liquid. At first, you think it's a vial of blood, but it's much too light in color; it has almost a fluorescent tone to it. And says, "If you need to send her a message." to pour this out into a bowl and scrawl the letters with your fingers and she'll receive it. Alexander will nod and tuck it into his alchemist's kit. She's in the meantime, we have to find out where Jack the Ripper's hideout is. <laughs> she gets out a board with 150 numbers on it. All right, I'm going to go stand in the southwest yeah. and accomplish nothing. And accomplish nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that reference. She, she places all the woman tokens. <laughs> uh, she seems to be taking this very seriously, but she also seems like this is a good excuse to flex some muscles she hasn't in a very long time. Uh, Seeker, she tells you that you're probably not in any mortal peril any longer, having come back from the dead. And she kind of just it reiterates that the weakness that you're feeling from being raised will fade over time. You'll find yourself stronger every day until you forget the thing ever happened. Do you have personal experience with this? And for the first time in the conversation, you see her kind of clam up. And no, I get it. And you sure. feel you have the answer to the question. Florian, you had a very fruitless and frustrating day. <laughs> Every deal that they sent you on fell through for the stupidest reasons. It had nothing to do with magical coercion. It's just like somebody said five pounds of bacon fat instead of five kilograms, and then the whole thing shut down. <laughs> it's what we get for using Imperial. Let's, I mean, <laughs> come on. Akiska's like, been on the metric system for centuries. Which that, of the candidates yeah. supports the metric system? That's one of the problems. <laughs> Every time you guys get a new king, all the measurements change. So. <laughs> Alright, so, 16 gorf blats of, uh, of, of wood. <laughs> so, Lucius, your evening action is to so go to... Like that. Uh, who has time? Who has time with... For the and, meeting. And, yeah, with... Uh, Corio and Elman. Is anybody else going to the clock bar tonight? I mean, I like who has time. I just feel like there's a lot of stuff we need to get done still. <laughs> if, if someone else is going, I'll go. I don't really want to hang out with Lucius and a couple of fops. <laughs> what about, what is Florian doing? Do you know? I'm just going down my list here. I think Florian wants to hang out with Alex. Okay. Florian has a very funny idea. <laughs> Are you going to share your funny idea with the class, or do we have to guess? Yes. I think it sounds like, I mean, once once Alex and uh, Seeker talk about Warlocks, mm -hmm. Florian suggests what we really need to do is we need to hook up Choreo Fireblood and a demon <laughs> and we'll pack that way. To reinstate the house. <laughs> Did you say that with Lucius in the room? <laughs> Is Lucius there? <laughs> Is it your intention to say that with Lucius in the room? Um, yeah, why not? Lucius goes white as a sheet, which is impressive for a tiefling, <laughs> and says, No, don't do that. That's bad. Is there something you can form a pact with that isn't like a demon? Like, don't they, aren't there, like, fey or maybe flumps? I think that's what the there, other one is. I've heard 
um, I've heard of research, yeah, at the School of Senses into such things. And... <laughs> well, the School but, of Senses uh... would would teach that the only way for warlocks to get power is from fiends. Because recall that the headmaster of the School of the Senses is an Arcanoloth with an agenda. That's right. <laughs> But, uh, that is Florian's suggestion. Well, wait. <laughs> we'll put that in, I don't like... think it's going to work, Florian, because if you do something super evil to get something's attention, or neutral, or whatever, because you're trying to do it to get a warlock, it'd be for your own gain, and the whole thing wouldn't work. <laughs> I, I don't know, guys. Oh, I mean, hmm. buying up that's other people's point. buying up other people's student loans to, to get them to do things, that's pretty evil. Like, student loans, in all, like just in a nutshell, are evil. I mean, that's just business. Do we? I I think I would like to investigate unsolved heinous crimes like that in the city. Okay. I mean, I know yeah. she's working on it from a, maybe a more mystical <laughs> angle, but maybe I go talk to the moss caps if anyone wants to come with me. That intrigues Florian. So Alex uh, and Florian are going to go speak with moss caps about possible murders. Yeah. Oh, I was going to get Florian to come with me to go see the uh, lady, the dancer. Is she a dancer or a singer? She's a harpist. Uh, she's a harpist. Hmm. That's a tough decision. Florian would like both of those things. <laughs> um, well, Seeker, what do you want to do? I think money is a, is an imperative here, so I'm, I think he'd prioritize Alex. Okay. Also, during this conversation, Gus is just kind of sidling up to Seeker and just kind of looking at him real hard, yeah. and he just he just kind of nonchalantly pokes him with a needle. <laughs> what? Why? Why? <laughs> then he'll go. He'll, he'll go. Never mind, and he'll throw it over his shoulder. Oh, and now, now there's a needle on the floor. The yeah, you can retrieve it. You pay. It's a. It's an. It's a, like a regular sewing needle, except it's uh -huh. made out of silver, which doesn't make any sense to you. Does how different is this from the needles that we pulled off of the assassination site in the? Very during, different. Uh, those were Penniless's Those speech. were much longer and a different material. This is just a silver sewing needle. Uh, and I'll... You don't need to save me anything like this if you're going to have it. Like, I could really use scraps of silver. It's good tension. Like, there's like one fiftieth of the amount of silver in this needle than the coin he paid for it. Oh, I know. And But, yeah, it immediately goes into uh, Alexander's Alchemist's supplies kit. What is Seeker uh, also... doing this evening? Well, do you want to okay. come with me? Yeah, I'll come with you. Let's go see this dancer. Uh, harpist. Harpist, or whatever. I mean, she can dance, too. Well, wait, if I go with you, are you going to poke me again? <laughs> I don't have a needle anymore. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I don't, because and, and then he'll go, well, I'll leave my spear if it'll make you feel better. No. <laughs> if we run into anyone, you're poking them off. Okay. <laughs> you're so good at it. Right, I am a master poker. Lucius. Yes. Elman shows up at Who Has Time fashionably late. Actually, I shouldn't have even loaded this map. Does. I gotta go right back to Wharf Town. Uh, Corio shows up fashionably later. And <laughs> Corio okay. brings such a large entourage with him that it's impossible to fit the whole party in Who Has Time. This place is filled... This little halfling... This quaint little like halfling bar in the in the base of this clock tower, which was never designed to hold a lot of people, is packed with this amazing party that is okay. spilling out into the streets <laughs> and getting completely out of hand. All right, Elman and Corio are hitting it off fabulously. They both have the same love of just. We are way too rich. What can we possibly <coughs> spend all of our money on and get drunk fast enough to numb the pain for one more day, kind of? What is Lucius's reaction to this? Lucius is, is observing this, and he's trying to th maybe use this opportunity, one, to steer the conversation back to what he asked Elman to find out, and two, maybe find out where Corio gets all of his money. Uh, 
Make an investigation check. Actually, let's call this a persuasion check, because you're trying to steer his conversation. That's a 10. What's your passive insight? Actually, actually... People got blips now. You guys got some blips. Yeah, I got blips. I think I want blips for this. Yeah, I'm uh -oh. going to spend two blips okay. and re-roll that. Because I don't like that at all. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, that's a 13. 13? What's your passive insight? Passive insight is 8. Try as you might, you can't get anything out of Corio about where his money comes from. He just has a lot of it, and he likes spending it quickly and for the benefit of all of his friends and everybody is Corio's friend partway Except through the evening plump pink, apparently <laughs> what do you mean you guys are some of his best he actually brought one of you back to life that's not something he would do just for anybody i mean but he could just absolve us of our debt and that would be fine but apparently not <laughs> partway through the night uh, Rowan Cotton has no more booze. He has tapped all of his kegs. All of his wine is gone. The gut rot is gone. I mean, they're down to the turpentine. At which point, to keep the party going, Corio actually sends people out to bring more booze in. I mean, you got people hanging off the clock by the end of the evening. <laughs> Elman and Corio are hitting it off. Famously, and all of Wharf Town and all of this area of Wharf Town is celebrating. Mm -hmm. What's your actual I... response to the party, though? Because you're not able to really get any useful information out of them, other than putting these two men together. You're not sure what you've accomplished here. Because my entire intent for this was to try and pull some information about how uh, House Fireblood and its mm -hmm. previous. Uh, its previous activities, and it looks like that all I've managed to do is just waste two guys' money. On that store, on, like on that score, Corio is has no end to the fabulous stories of his famous ancestors, especially the great hero Eldov, who was one of the founders of the Blue Wormling Inn. Did you know that the great free city of Blue Worm started? But a humble crossroads inn in the middle of nowhere. And he regales I mean, you with, it, like, every time you want to talk about House Fireblood, he's more than happy to oblige. There's just no telling I'm, how much of it is true. I'm, yeah, I'm more interested in, you know, what, what, what's been happening here in Dunfoss mm -hmm. with regard to House, House Fireblood instead of, uh, <laughs> yeah, Blue Worm is great and all, but... I'm more interested in what Fireblood has done here in Dunfoss. He's more interested in getting you a much larger glass of wine. Because, meaning no offense, my good friend, but you're being a bit stodgy. And everybody I mean, agrees that you need to drink more and faster. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'd like to, you know, work on what he has he's tasked us to do and that's what i was trying to do apparently. and you find the evening very frustrating with elman and corio in this cramped little halfling bar with way too much booze with way too many friends <laughs> way too late into the evening <clears throat> too many times moss caps have to come by and disperse a crowd that just recongeals but a few minutes later and it is late into the night when finally elman Stumbles off and Corio slaps you on the back and tells you that it was a wonderful time. Not his typical venue, not what he would have chosen, but a quaint establishment that he was happy to give custom. And he will be sure to tell all of his friends across Dunfoss and the wide world of the wonderful bar of Rowan Cotton. And he yells in, Rowan, what time is it? Rowan says very tiredly for inside. So I believe it's time for bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lu Lucia, Lucius actually cracks a smile at that. 
Like I like I, I don't know of anybody who have been able to party out Rowan Cotton, but <laughs> I Oreo mean, did it. Keep in mind, this he doesn't run like a party house. He runs like a quaint little halfway yeah. establishment. <laughs> He does, like, wine tastings and things. Uh, okay. Gustavus and Seeker. At some point in the evening, your dealings here in Wharftown are going to be at least partially interrupted by the massive party that's going to break out a couple blocks away. Okay. Uh, so Starfingers is a very well-known bard in wharf town she's hired on at a place called the dead man's den which is a smoke shop and open secret it's also an illicit opium den let me get my notes on this place here shock shocked really are you it's a very colorful building uh they have colorful rolls of cloth hanging out the windows to add some vibrance to the place. Uh, it's very vibrantly painted on the one side that faces the streets. The proprietor of the Dead Man's Den is notable because he's a Tabashi, and he might be the only Tabashi that you all know that lives in Dunfoss. At least the only one that uh, owns and operates a business. His name is Gazvin Savad. Gazvin insists on cleanliness and presentation in his building at all times. He does not tolerate weapons or magic on the premises. And very pointedly, he refuses to admit children or people that he thinks are showing up already too drunk to put his, uh, his goods to use. <laughs> he just looks at Gus very suspiciously. He has, you... <laughs> like, most nights if Gus rolls up looking for a hookah, he'll be like, you know, you're not going to enjoy this hookah, Gus. You got to come back another night before you get blasted on green alcohol. And you'll enjoy the hookah much more. Uh, this is notable because this is a businessman who's essentially leaving money on the table. Mo most taverns, like, if the kid comes in and he's got money... They'll serve them. They don't care. He has Starfingers, who is a beautiful young human, uh, young human woman. Very talented harpist. She does the paintings on the side of the building. And her job is essentially to be on the street during the day, making sure that the area outside of the Dead Man's Den is always filled with music. And as you approach her, uh, she does have this very distinctive cloak that she wears the back of which is styled to look like angel wings. And some motion of her uh, arms and elbows, she's able to move and make the wings look like they're moving of their own accord. Is this woman known to either of you? No. Not personally, no. Okay. Then she doesn't pay much attention to you as you approach, and she's playing a well-known elven song on her harp. I'll look down at Seeker and look up into her and, like, who wants to take point on this? Hey, well, I'll I'll here. You're, you're running the show. Okay, so, uh, I'll, like, like, I'll explain to Seeker that the, like, the names just came up in relation to, it's kind of like a situation, like, say, Breath of Earth 2, where, like, you're looking for the winged person and they send you to Corsair and then they send you to, back to hometown and you end up with, you know, all right, Context explain it to me like I haven't played old RPGs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, you mean you haven't played 1995's 13th best RPG, Breath of Fire 2? <laughs> anyway, I'm so offended right now. Anyway, uh... <laughs> uh... I was asking about the uh, Flying Pig symbol and then these uh, the two names came up uh the old lady who i don't think you should go see because she thinks you're a uh you're now like a homunculus of some kind the seeker looks down on his arm am i <laughs> i mean the priest didn't seem to think so the needle didn't seem to think so although i didn't really exactly follow the instructions but that's not here nor there uh and her name came up and i figured even if she doesn't know 
you know anything about it this is a you know this is a den of an iniquity a very clean one but still and then you know a lot of people come through maybe somebody in here will know all right so. i want to be clear though it didn't just come up because she has wings right yeah. that's not why we're here gus gus kind of shrugs at you and says i don't know you'll have to ask Gus, uh, drunk Gus, the next time he shows up. Oh god, you didn't tell me drunk Gus sent us here. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, I don't know, I wasn't there. I do can't we, listen to secondhand knowledge from Do me. we need to maintain a separate character sheet for drunk Gus? <laughs> like, are you playing two characters? <laughs> Last yes. time drunk I Gus sent now. us something, we ended up with a coffin. <laughs> I mean, you know, the boat was a nice present. I think it sets off my room very nicely. Seeker is starting here. to sound a lot like you're here because she has wings. And they're not real wings, they're fake wings. How is she at playing the harp? Very, very talented. But it's a song that any harpist would know. It's <clears throat> Seeker has resolved himself to enjoy the harp playing. Okay. And he goes and orders a drink. Like, Gus is going to go speak to the proprietor of the establishment and ask if he has heard anything of uh, this, if he's so you guys, symbol, the... you're, you're going to walk past the harpist and go into the dead man's den. Well, yes? okay, first I'll, I'll do that and then I'll stop and go, you know what, why the hell not? Drunk Gus has never steered me wrong. And I'll turn around and I'll not go, true. man, <laughs> I ignore that comment, by the way. <laughs> Okay. And I go, ma'am, where did you get that lovely cloak? And I'm assuming you politely wait until a gap in her song. You don't yes. just walk up and interrupt yes. her. Okay. I just don't like slap her in the face and say, where's your cloak? No. Drunk Gus would have just blurted it out in the middle of the song. <laughs> right. But I'm not playing Drunk Gus. Gotcha. Uh, is a much lower no, she tells you that she made it herself and she blushes a little bit. At the compliment. And Gus will balance. It reminds me of a uh, a symbol that we've seen before. And, and I'll look down at Seeker and be like, uh, can you describe it to her? If you tell this teenage girl that she reminds you of a pig you saw once. <laughs> That's why I got... How old, how old teenage? Uh, hey, Seeker, when we split up, I left you with that stone coin. So you can just tap it and the image will appear on it. Oh yeah, I'm not doing that though. <laughs> okay, just you know. Yeah, no, I mean she's she's a young she's a young girl. Like you can't tell I don't know, 17, 18 years old, hey, but I'm looking for a pig and you're the first name that came up. <laughs> like like I just picture like Seeker like just kicking me like very mm -hmm. Okay. Ow, ow, ow. Okay. Like, is why why did you uh, decide to go with the uh, the wing motif, though? And she describes to you, uh, she tells you that it's in honor of her mother, who had the most beautiful ashen-colored wings. And she describes to you the story of this woman, and you recognize it as a common fairy tale that she's adapted to answer this exact question. She's not telling you the truth in any capacity, but she's telling you a very pretty lie. Can I make a uh, insight check to do to say whether or not like she's trying to hide something or whether or not it's just because she came up with it one day because she was drawing wings on things and was like that's pretty sweet. Uh What if any connection does Seeker have to just like the basic politics and intrigue of the various magic guilds. Does he kind of stay out of it completely? He doesn't care? Or would he have some basic knowledge of how they interact and kind of play off each other and jockey for position, etc.? Seeker would have basic knowledge if only to avoid it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and make an insight check. It's the same reason Seeker has a book of laws in his room. <laughs> Alright, that is a 13. 
she tells you this story, and it's like I said, it's a fairy tale you've heard before. She's changed some details to make the character in the story her mother, who is this angelic woman who had these beautiful wings, but she died tragically and too young without knowing true love, etc., etc. It's a nice story, and you can uh-huh. see the details that she's changed to make it fit her own life. She is trying to make it sound like it's not the story you've heard. She realizes that nobody's going to actually believe this is the truth, but she's trying to impress you with her version of this story. What this tells you is that while she's very good at arranging known words, she does not have the actual creativity befitting a bard. It also tells you that she has no desire to actually answer personal questions to a weird guy in a cloak. Who looks half dead, who they just met, and might also very quickly be comparing her to a pig. We spent a lot of money to not for me to not look half dead. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you're still at minus three penalty on all your skill checks, so yeah, you look at least a little bit dead. Worst. <laughs> um, okay, so from that, Seeker kind of gets the impression, oh, she's just telling the story because she wants to sound impressive. She's mm-hmm. a bard. Yeah. Well, she's trying to be a bard. With that insight roll, you get the sense that she would not make a very good bard for that exact reason. You know, I've always found that bards know the most about what's going on in a town. Okay. And Seeker slides a uh, silver coin across. Does she have like a hat or something? Like She doesn't kind of... because she's employed by the proprietor of this establishment. So she very pointedly doesn't have like a hat out. And when you go to offer her a coin, she... Holds up her hand as she politely refuses. She says uh, that if you're here to spend coin, she beckons to the door and says there's more pleasurable experiences to be had inside. And Seeker nods and puts it into his pocket and says, I'll make sure to buy something then and let your proprietor know that it was you who brought in my business. And she smiles brightly. But in any case... We've been looking for something around the town, and nobody seems to know anything about it. Have you ever seen something that looks like this before? And Seeker will bring out the coin and tap it. Okay. And she looks at it, and she stammers for a moment, as though she's trying to, like, put together a story on the spot of a flying pig and something. But she doesn't Uh actually get there. And she just settles kind of sheepishly on no, she doesn't. She doesn't know the image. She hasn't seen it. And and Seeker will nod and say, that's fine. That's all I was hoping to know for. And as one to another, anytime you can't come up with a good story, people would prefer to just hear, you don't know. And, and she Seeker turns and, oh. bright red when she sees that you've caught her. Yeah, and I mean, listen, kid charlatans are out there every day. <laughs> <laughs> and Seeker will go and... Uh, go inside and do what he said he was going to do. He'll order something and say that he was brought in by their harpist. Okay. Uh, Gus, are you also going in? I'm going in as well, and I'm going to speak to the proprietor. So the first thing that happens when you go in, there is a table to your right as you enter the door, and on the wall behind them are is a weapon rack and coat hooks and all manner of... uh, Polite ways to organize the weapons and magical implements that they absolutely will not allow you into this building while carrying. I mean, Gus will leave his spear and his hammer, and he'll take off his little singular throwing axe. (laughs) Do they look like they're going to search me? I guess the question is, are you planning on sneaking anything in? Do I have... Seeker would just ignore it unless it looks like someone's literally going to search it. Oh, no, there's somebody at the at the table, and, I mean, you're walking in with somebody that's covered in weapons. They're probably uh-huh. not They're not going to pat you down unless you do something suspicious. It's going to be an opposed role if you try to... Can, like, if I make, like... Like, is this a thing, like, you're like... Is Seeker going to, like... Is Gu- if Gus is no- knowingly... If I know you're going to try and sneak something in... I'll make, like, a big show of, like, pulling out my weapons to give you a distraction. So, Seeker, what's going to happen here is, like, I know that you don't carry a lot of weapons on you. 
Uh huh. What do you actually carry? So I have my uh, I have a dagger which I'll put in there mm -hmm. along with my spell book. Sure. I'm going to leave my spell focus on me because I figure even if they search me, it looks like a quill. I'll get away with it. What is your spell focus? It's a, uh, it's it's a very nice quill. Shaped... Yeah. Okay. Make a deception check. That's a pretty good roll. And yeah, he seems the man at the table seems satisfied when you plunk this spell book down along with this dagger. And he takes your possessions and he says that uh, they'll be carefully looked after and be returned when you leave. And he appreciate. Not to give them my shield. Oh yeah. Do I have to give them my shield? Yes. You might hit someone with. Also, I mean, if you're a monk, you've got to cut off your hands. Sorry, but. <laughs> It's the rules. <laughs> Thank God we don't have any monks in this campaign. Like, Ridiculous would, class. Would they accept like uh, have? Would they accept somebody plucking their eyeballs out? That's you have to, horrifying. That's not gonna stop a monk. <laughs> <laughs> he knows from a. Uh, you gotta put peace gl gloves on and peace bond your hands. <laughs> Florian and Alexander. Mm -hmm. Can I get a an investigation check from each of you? As you're right. speaking with moss caps, I also where in town are you both going? Are you going together as a as a pair? Do you want to split up, or do you think we should go together, Florin? Uh, is there any place you have better contacts? Like I could probably, I think I could work well in uh, whatever district the Gnomish Embassy is in. I don't think so. Uh, no, okay, that's really not Florian's character. So, but uh, I will roll investigation. I'll say that each of you can cover one district of the city. Okay. Speaking the moss caps in one place. If you're both going to the same place, I'll let each of you roll an advantage. Uh, can I let's see go to the map same of place. the city? Okay, let's go to the same place. Yeah, let's go to the same place. I can give you the map of the city. And I obviously am smoking a guided cigarette before doing this. Oh, obviously. <laughs> obviously, of course. Uh, where's my city map? I don't have it saved in tabletop. I've got it on... Ah, here we go. <clears throat> Assuming you want the district uh, map, which is yeah, the really colorful one. But I think we're going to the same place. So yeah, yeah. High priest of Ostrom's warming. Uh, smoking has been known to cause lung cancer. What? <laughs> All right, I got to throw that in for every every session. Um, I think yeah. high bluff. You think high bluff? Yeah, high bluffs is a place where there's many noble residences. There's right. a lot of manor houses. And large estates. Oh, I get what you're thinking. You yeah, know, yeah. Right. Picking up what you're putting down. So that's that's a 19 on investigation. And what did Florian get? Uh oh, at advantage, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That is a 23. Okay. <clears throat> And Gustavus and Seeker, you're attempting to speak with the proprietor of Dead Man's Den, Gesvin? Yeah. Yes. What do you say that's going to get you into Gesvin's room, do you imagine? Like, what do you what do you pass along that you're here to inquire about? I mean, he seems like an up and up, like, he seems like a... Like a person who doesn't want his city exploded, right? Is anybody in this party addicted to opiates? Is anybody at this hookah den at all hours of the week? Uh, would Florian be addicted to opiates? <laughs> Is he chasing the dragon? <laughs> Only when his name starts with O. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine the addiction is a, is a step too far. I think he likes opiates, but... Okay. So you like to chase the dragon, but not actually catch it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a perfect Florian description. Yeah. I think after the night Lucian's had, he would go chase the dragon. The place will be closed by the time you're done partying. Are you kidding me? Uh, darn. <laughs> uh, so yeah, what do you guys pass along that Savad would want to speak with you? Gus and Seeker. I'm going to get this answer and then we're going to take a break because my dog is out there going crazy because she has not been let out yet. 
Son of a bitch. I, I, hmm. I just assumed he'd be out front and we could talk to him. This is... Yeah, I mean, what are we trying to get from him? We're just trying to see if he has any information. The... Uh, in general? Yeah. Like, no, just to, in the... About the flying pig. Possibly uh, the servant boy, the servant halfling. Seeker, there is like, there's like three other people you could have gone with tonight. And you picked yeah, and... Sober Gus. <laughs> Sober Gus sucks. Where's Drunk Gus? <laughs> Drunk Gus is even worse. <laughs> they don't actually sell alcohol here. They sell like cleansing tonics and things that purge the body of toxins so that That's the anti-alcohol. So the psychedelic drugs can more fervently take hold inside the psyche. Alright, so... You guys want to think about it through the break? We'll think about it through the break. Okay. Okay.